Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, and especially the ambassador, Ziv Nevo Kulman is here. Thank you for coming. And uh, before I start, I want to uh, not to forget, I think it's a good opportunity to thank that there was a lot of work behind what happened here, I'm sure you understand. Every detail, every bus, every lunch, every timing, all was controlled by three really wonderful people from our center. So I really want to thank uh, the three women, so to speak. So <laughs> yeah, just let people uh, come, come in. Come in. I really want to thank the organizers, Kim and Orid and Varda, for doing such an absolutely wonderful job. Thank you very much for coming here twice and doing all that you did. So, so today I don't want to speak necessarily, I, I just mentioned in the beginning about what I am doing in the lab, we are doing in the lab, but I want to talk a little bit more about other aspects, you heard much of uh, manipulating or getting into the brain. I want to discuss aspects that are connected to what we call brain-machine interface. May, and, and, and even more recently, brain-machine avatar interface. So how does the brain make use of machine, activate machine, or make use of machine in order to improve <coughs> itself or different sources? So I'll just start with my own interest in, in what makes us human. How, how are we so creative and so forth? Of course, this is an open question. I look at it only from my own perspective, trying to understand what is unique about human neurons. But then I'll go to the brain-machine interface world. We have an expert, big expert in our center, Hagai Bergman, who I will mention. So we'll discuss this, how do you expand your body, internalize an internal machine in, in becoming part of you, extending some capabilities, or in case where you don't have these capabilities, you can extend these capabilities with a machine. And recently, as I will tell you, I became interested in, in the avatar world and the use of avatars for therapy, but for much more. So that's the plan. I hope that I will have, and Ellie will permit me, to, hopefully, to even extend five minutes or more, we shall see. And at the end, maybe after five or not, there is this whole movement of digital immortality transhumanism, things that machines can help us to extend ourselves beyond the biological death. We are not going to discuss it in this talk, but you should have it in your mind. So let me start by just mentioning that we, the Homo sapiens, are just here on the world something like 300,000 years ago. So this particular species that <coughs> is sitting here is only 300,000 years old. And uh, of course, during the evolution, we saw many other close, uh, clo close uh, relatives to us, including humanoids that lived together with us up until 30 or 40,000 years ago, like the Neanderthals and others. But what is very unique about the human, but by, by the way, you, you can see, so, so this is a brain volume, and this is years in million, and you can see so that, that there is in this during this time there is an increase in the volume of the brain but then also decrease in the volume of the brain in the last 10,000 years not during the talk but in the last 10,000 years and that's of course the question why why is our brain volume decreases in the last 10,000 years there it's not very clear but anyway so, so you, of course there is a relationship between the size of the brain to our capacities number of cells and so forth. I don't want to go into the fine details about what is unique about the human brain that maybe makes us so creative. I will talk a little bit about it, but what is very clear to all of us, and you can see it in this meeting, that we are absolutely creative, so much so that so exponentially things are growing from about you know, 6,000 years ago or so when art started although the genome was the same, and that, that's something I want to emphasize, we didn't change genetically. So when I'm saying that we are living 300,000 years, I mean that our genome, and Iran can tell you more about that because he's using ancient DNA, he mentioned at the beginning, but he didn't speak about that, so we can compare our DNA sequences to a DNA of an ancient person, and see that, you know, 300,000 years ago, the DNA looks very similar to us, so I can say this is a species. The DNA did not change. But what did change is what we call the cultural evolution, whereby with the same DNA we can start to create and create and create and create and create more and more things, 
which is something really amazing and no other animals that we know can do such a, a, an amazingly speedy cre cre creativity generating new worlds, new machines that interact with us even so that you heard we can even manipulate our own gene we just spoke with uh, outsiders and our own gene generate brains that are so creative that they can manipulate their own gene and repair ourselves, excel our life and create new animals we have in the lab new animals with new genetics that were, did not exist before, so we created new animals because we understand the genetics. So this is something very unique about the human brain, and I think this meeting, this brain circle meeting, is, is a generation of a brain, in this case a little bit my brain too, so generation of an invention that created this meeting and so forth, but of course art and other inventions. And I want to talk a little bit about avatars because this is very recent invention of the human brain. <coughs> so, so we are in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, revolution. We are somewhere here. You can see there is a very, very, very steep increase in, in innovation, in creativity, and, and of course driving the, the world gross domestic production. And so this is what we have today relative to the time past with, with, since 2000 until today in terms of the growth of productivity. And we are in this special time, really unique time, and you will hear more about this from Heim, you already heard yesterday about AI and machine learning, it is called the fourth industrial revolution, the cyber physical systems that are doing all this genome ed editing, machine intelligence, breakthrough in new materials, we did not speak about that, uh, blockchains and all these digital ideas that came to this human brain. So, so, so of course it's, a, it's one of the fundamental questions that interests me and, and, and many of us of course is, is, is what makes us so creative what is unique about the human brain that makes us so creative so I just brought a few examples you just heard about these two wonderful absolutely amazing women that got Nobel Prize uh, you heard it from Nomi uh, and, uh, from the, uh, about the crystals but these are very unique people is there something unique about the brain of Picasso that crossed through all these periods you know from the blue period and, to, and inventing the cubism and Freud and others. What is unique about the human brain? So of course I'm not going to answer that because I don't know the answer and nobody here knows the answer. Is it the number of cells? Something about the connectivity in the brain? But I'm particularly interested in looking on single cells. Is there something unique about the human neurons relative to what we compare it to usually, which is the rodents, to the mouse, is something unique in, in the human brain in terms of development that maybe makes them already as a microchip itself, the neuron, more sophisticated computational device. Do we have more sophisticated microchips in our brain? By the way, we have 100 billion microchips, so <coughs> 10 to the power of 11 nerve cells in our brain is a huge number. Of course, it's big, but there are bigger brains than us. Some dolphins uh, have bigger brains than so whales, but, so, but they are not smarter than us as much as we know. It's hard, to, but they don't develop all the things that we develop. So what is unique about the human brain? And there is now, just for you to know, there is a new, uh, very, very strong tendency to try to understand individual cells in terms of the types. How many? Maybe we should close the door. What is it? Um, so, 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 so there is this new project, highly supported by the NIH, the National Institute of, uh, of Health in America, to try to understand individual cell types. So Nomi mentioned there are different types of neurons, or not only neurons, but also certain many types of neurons. So it's like you go to the forest and you see different trees. There is this type of a tree, there is another type of a tree. Morphologically they look different. But, but there are also different types genetically. So one type of nerve cell generate or, or uh, 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 activate certain group of genes, so you call it a pyramidal cell, and another cell in the same region looks a little bit different and it generates due to the same genome, but some other genes are being expressed and it looks a little different, it has a little different electrical activity. And so the cell census uh, uh, project worldwide is an attempt to characterize how many trees, let's call it like that, you have in the forest. How many types of trees you have in the forest. Is it a thousand types of nerve cells in the brain? Types, not number total, because each type, of course, has many, many, many replica of itself, but how many types of cells do you have in the, in the, in the brain? 
Why is it so important? Because many, 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 many diseases, not all, but many, many diseases are related to specific cell type. So for example, in Parkinson, you already heard that some type of cells, the dopaminergic nerve cells in the striatum, they get sick, they die, and you see a disease. So many of the diseases, out of about 360 human diseases, brain-related human diseases, you know only few, Parkinson, Huntington, uh, Alzheimer's, and so forth, we have 360 defined diseases, each one is related to certain malfunction of specific cell type or types, but not all of them. Of course, when you have stroke, many cell types die because of the stroke, but for a specific disease, it's typically not many cell types that are not functioning. So that's why it's important to find which cell type is involved with which disease. And then you may be able to target this particular cell type and not another cell type with all these new tools that you heard about. So that's why it becomes more and more interesting to characterize cell types in the brain and I'm part of, some part of my lab is interested in this aspect of characterization of cell types in the brain and especially in the human brain. And in the human brain, only very recently, we are able to take individual cells, alive, living cells, and study them. So you heard a lot about the mouse, a lot. And so the course, I, I just, in the last three years, I gave a, a very interesting course with Yuval Noah Harari. You may all heard about him, very well known for his Sapien, Sapiens book. Uh, and, 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 and so we, we gave a course. And in my part, which was the technological part, I spoke about mouse all the time. And at the end he said, I, why do you speak about mouse all the time? Uh, we are human, and you talk about mouse and mouse and mouse. And I told, you, I told him, and, and you heard, we can do a lot of manipulation on the mouse brain and the genes and so forth. You don't do it in human. So until very recently, we didn't have really living, behaving, so to speak, or circuits of human cells. But we actually had it, because in, in brain operations, like in this example, typically you take a big part of the human brain, because you need to take the tumor. It could be a deep tumor here, this region is healthy, so the cortex might be healthy, but deep inside the tumor <coughs> is, is, is residing and you have to take it out. And typically you take big part of this brain, human brain, in any hospital every day. A brain operation ends with this being outside, so this is a fresh tissue. And you can put it in a physiological solution and this tissue will continue to live for, for many months. And you can take part of it, and you can see how big the tissue you typically, typically take in the hospital relative to the... So this is the same scale. So the tissue you take out in, in such an operation is much larger than the whole brain of the mouse. And, and what is recently, in about 10 labs in the world, you can take this tissue, so this was a human tissue, you can cut it into slices, you can stain individual cells, you can reconstruct them anatomically, you can see the structure of the cell, and these are cells that are functioning, so you can implant <coughs> electrode there, you can record the electrical activity, and because there are many cells, you can record the, the connectivity between the cells, the synaptic activity, how strong they talk to each other, how many contacts they have between each other. So you can't ask questions about individual human cells because you have this tissue outside. It was there before, I mean, people did this operation a long, long time ago, but typically it was not taken into the lab. And there are about 10 labs in the world today that work closely with physicians who give them this tissue post-operation and then they take it to the lab and they do what we know to do with the mouse brain but in this case with this tissue or rather than the mouse brain. So you get very interesting information and again I don't want to go into it because I want to go to other aspects not to talk about myself so much but you can get really high resolution of these human cells so I'm convincing you that you are built from cells because this is a human neurons from a tissue like that. You can, you can in high resolution, look at all these specific protrusions where connections are made with other cells. So there is a new another cell here that sends what we call an axon that make a connection here, maybe another connection here. So we know where the connections between one human cells to another human cells. We know the structure. We can do electrophysiological recording. We can do genetics because we can take out the DNA of these cells and sequence it. So this is a, a, a new, so to speak, it's not new in principle, but it's new in many labs, that you can start to uh, study neurons of human neurons alive, fresh, fresh tissue. 
And so you start to build banks, human, ba human cell banks, banks of different cell types. In this case, all of them are from the cortex, but you, because some operations are being done in the hippocampus or in the, in the cerebellum, we have now a bigger, bigger living cell taken from adult brain and study that. So we got into this interest I, 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 into area and trying to use some mathematical tools in order to characterize are there many cell types, both the genetic, morphological, and so forth. You can see by eye that they have a little bit different structures, but we need some mathematical tools to analyze. Is this tree different than this tree? Can I call them with different names or no? So, so we were the first in about uh, what is it, six years ago to find out that in the human cortex, in the human cortex, temporal cortex here, where the operations are typically being done, we, we found two cell types in terms of morphology that looks different than the cell types that we saw in the mouse. So it's not only that we are replica in terms of cell types in the mouse, we also have new cell types, genetically new cell types, that do not appear in the mouse, did not exist in the mouse. So this is the first demonstration of new cell type that does not exist in rodents. They may exist in monkeys, because we didn't do this in monkeys, but in rodents, these cell types do not exist. And very recently, we published a paper together with a big group from the Allen Institute in Seattle, where they used both genetic uh, 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 tools to extract the DNA from these cells. We are using our an mathematical analysis to, to analyze the structure of the different cells and also the electrophysiological characterization of the cells. So when I'm saying cell type, I mean that this cell type is new because it has an expression of gene that was not expressed or was not found to be expressed, let's say, in rodents, but it also has electrical activity and also morphologically different structure than the structure we are aware of. So we found three new cell types that seems to be connected to, to some new capabilities of the human being, in this case, new capabilities to be sick. Because, for example, some diseases seems to be unique to human. For example, schizophrenia. We don't know, don't have a good model, at least, of schizophrenic mouse. We have a good model of Parkinsonian mouse. We have a good model of autistic mouse. But we don't have a good model of schizophrenic mouse. So there is a starting of starting of a connection. It's a very, very beginning start of a connection between cell types and specific diseases. So that's, that's the direction. The other direction that we are taking in our lab, and again, I didn't want to dwell much into it, but just to highlight what we do, is, is the following question. So the cell, as you can see, is a, is a sophisticated morphological element. So this is the cell body, where all the genome is being activated, the machinery. But there is this very unique structure of neurons, which you all know. It's, it really looks like trees of different types. So what does this mean in terms of processing information? Because you know this, this neuron that is about, let's say this is the cortex, so this is the surface of the cortex, and this is deep into the cortex, let's say some two millimeters deep, and this cell has this extension, and this cell receives something on the order in the mouse of 10,000 connections. So you can think about the tree receiving 10,000 synapses, 10,000 connections from other, other cells, nearby or far away and they process this input information and eventually they generate an output. So what kind of microchip it is? How sophisticated, how complicated a microchip that takes 10,000 inputs and decides on an output, an input-output device. A microchip that receives analog input, synapses, synaptic potentials, generate digital output in the axon. How sophisticated it is computationally? So we are using deep networks and AI technologies or approaches to try to find analog surrogate to this, to this cell uh, by a deep network. So we are asking if you are simulating this cell, how deep should the deep network be in order to replicate one by one all the input you receive here to the input you receive here. So we just try to transform the complexity of this tree into a deep network and ask how deep is the network that succeeds to replicate input output input output input output of this cell. So in, in rodents we found that for this particular cell type it's about seven layers deep. And I mentioned yesterday about depth 
of the deep neurons and they're somehow related to the complexity of computation that you can make with this microchip. So we are now taking the human neurons that I mentioned and I'm asking the same question. If these cell types in the rodent, let's say seven layers deep, which means that it can solve certain computational problems, how deep are human neurons? Are they 11 layers deep or, or not? So that's what we are now today. We already have some results, but I don't want to go into it. I want to go into this. So let's start with the history of brain-machine interface. It happened by this very, very unusual fellow, Spaniard, Jose Manuel Rodriguez Delgado, who in, 60, in 1969, he was a very unusual fellow, he wrote a very, un, very, very, very controversial book, which is, this is the name, I, I succeeded to find very rare copy of this book. He was eventually fired from Yale and so forth, very unusual personality, but he was the first to implant electrodes. You, you may see them here, very thin electrodes, to particular regions in the brain of, 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 a, of a bull, in Spaniard after all, and so he wanted to ask, can I control the behavior of the bull from the outside by radio signals? So I want to show you a very, very rare clip that I succeeded to get, just to show you the experiment that he did with bulls. So these bulls are having electrodes and sensors, receivers, and from afar you can activate and electrically activate these particular electrodes and ask whether you can control the behavior of the, of the bull. So here is a short clip. In the 1960s, Professor Jose Delgado took a normally hostile bull and implanted electrodes into its brain. Electrodes that could be activated by a radio transmitter. His objective was to see if stimulation of the bull's midbrain could short circuit the rage signals. The rage signal. the bull before it reached the matador. After the bull had recovered from the implantation and in mid-charge, the button was pressed. The bull's aggression ceased instantly, or so it seemed. Okay, so this is, was the first scientifically brain-machine interface between the bull's brain and this distant machine that sends radio signals. But the same principle is being used in principle by Hagai Bellman. A guy Bergman in our center implant electrodes in the particular brain region. He was one of the first to do it systematically into a particular deep brain uh, region that you already heard about, striatum and basal ganglia. And he was recording from normal, non-Parkinsonian patients, in this case actually monkeys in the beginning, but later also in human. And you can see that in a normal, non-Parkinsonian brain, you get activity of individual cell types. So what you see here is the electrical activity of individual cells. Electrical activity, the, the, the signals in one cell. So if I would make noise for each signal, it would like, it sound like ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-
And this was shown to be absolutely extremely successful. So I'm showing sure you the Parkinsonian patient. This is a, an old, uh, old movie, one of the first ones that Hagai did. As you can see here, it's a, it's a young Parkinsonian patient in Hagai Medical School, already eight years with Parkinson, so he was taking the L-DOPA and everything that could be done to chemically, but it didn't work anymore. So they are now they're implanting the electrode that I just showed you before. So that's a very severe Parkinsonian patient at an advanced stage of the Parkinson. So the balance is very bad and the control of this movement. I always check myself if I have Parkinsonia by doing that. So if I can control my rhythm, the slow, faster, mm -hmm. and even faster, I don't have Parkinson. He cannot do it. Then he's being implanted. I've been to some of these uh, 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 dissections. It's very fast, actually. Haggai is really a big expert. Sitting in our center at LSEC every Friday, accepting people with Parkinson, just like that, for free, and advising them should they go to the, to the operation or to the operation. But anyway, the same person, few months after the operation, now with a battery, getting the injection into his brain, that's the guy. So that's a, that's a brain-machine interface. You take a machine, a battery, you activate the brain directly from the battery with the appropriate parameters. The Parkinson is essentially gone. Not completely. There are, of course, other aspects of Parkinson. It's not only motor, but you can do things like that. As I just told you, that if you make a fast test, it's not Parkinson. Anyway, so that's, that's a brain-machine interface. You take a machine, you change something in the brain, in this case electrically, and then something is changing. But recently, and I'm following this literature because I think it's amazing, this, this connection between the brain and the machine. Recently, there is a huge, huge, huge jump in brain-machine interface. Sometimes it is called brain-computer-machine interface because the computer is in between the machine and the activation. So in the last few years, actually, in the last two years, there is a huge jump that I want to share with you, and that's being done all over the world, especially in Stanford, but elsewhere as well, and Haggai is also part of some of it, and so forth. So I want to show you some cases, in this case, particular case, a guy, a few of them, and you can see how, how recent it is, a guy that, that, that had uh, a spinal cord injury, so he's completely paraplectic, cannot move, actually, for 10 years. He was sitting there, but because of these new devices, you can really read out the signals in the brain that are, that are the initiation of the movement, the intention to move, are being read out with electrodes in the brain, different types of electrodes. Yeah, you measure the region of activity that is the intention to move, but of course nobody listens because the, the spinal cord is cut, so the, 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 the body is paralyzed. But then you can use these signals through indirectly, you know, jumping across the spinal cord into a device that is being implanted in the spinal cord and then activate the limbs. Okay, so I want to show you a, a brief movie. Uh, so this is the fellow, you will hear him talking in a second. So he has to practice because after 10 years of not moving, the whole muscle and everything is, you know, reduced and so forth. So let, let, me, sh let me give you a, a brief uh, introduction. To what, what was done after 10 years in this. A spinal cord injury interrupts the communication between the brain and the region of the spinal cord that produces walking, leading to paralysis. To re-establish this communication, we implanted two reimagined systems composed of 64 electrodes to record the cortical activity associated with the intention to move the lower limbs. The electrode corticographic signals are transferred to a wearable processing unit that predicts the intended movements and translates these predictions into analog modulation of epidural electrical stimulation. This stimulation is delivered through a 16 electrode paddle lead that is implanted over the lumbosacral spinal cord and then connected to an implantable pulse generator. The participant was able to use this brain spring interface to walk naturally in community settings. So it's clear. So you overpass the cut spinal cord by taking a the spinal cord injury sorry, interrupt by, by taking the signals, the the, the usual the, the typical signals that the brain knows how to send into the spinal cord in order to do now. My hands moving and my legs are moving, but now I don't have the connection and you overpass it 
but you need of course to stimulate the correct nerves and the correct muscles in order to be able to directly from the brain activate it. So, th so that's the technology. Let me show you one fast another one. A spinal cord injury oh, interrupts the community. The next one. Pre-operative planning procedures to optimize the positioning of recording and stimulation implants over the brain and spinal cord. That's where AI comes in. Pre-operative imaging of brain activity during attempted movements of the lower limb identified the region most responsive to the intention to move. The optimal position of the panel lead was identified using a personalized computational model of the spine, elaborated from high-resolution structural imaging. The final location was optimized intraoperatively based on electrophysiological recordings. As early as day one, we could calibrate a model that enabled the participants to control the relative flexion of the hip from an avatar projected on a screen. We then calibrated an algorithm that converged in less than two minutes to enable the participant to exert gradual control over... So you see there is this a lot of data streaming from the spinal cord and from the brain and the AI machine takes all this data and optimizes the stimulus for, per this person. After this practicing with the avatar, so when he does this, the avatar does this, and when he does this, the avatar does this, and eventually he uses all this data to optimize the stimuli and then be enable this person to move. Let me give you a further downstream. I don't want to show you all the movie. But you can see this fellow is now practicing moving on his own. You remember, this guy was sitting on a chair for 12 years actually. It's the first time that he is moving outside on his own because he is now getting these commands directly into the spinal cord. And this is a matter of practicing. And this is really an amazing guy. This is actually five and six. And recently I have been implanted by brain spine interface. So as an example, I can start the stem with my brain. I can talk while doing it, and if I want, I can also maintain the stimulation while talking. Pre-operative plan. That's amazing, no? So that's one direction. The other direction is people that cannot speak. They can't think about words but they don't they are not able to articulate the mouth and the lips and so forth to generate one. I was very fascinated by this recent 2021 uh, uh, article in Nature where people are again implanting electrodes to a particular brain region in this case to the motor cortex region where they ask the patient to practice thinking about writing the letter A in their brain think about physically writing the letter A, motor-wise. Do this movement, so to speak, in your brain. These are paralyzing the people. <laughs> and, so, so, and, the be and the machine really reads the activity of the many electrodes being implanted here when the person is writing in his head the letter A, or when the person is writing in his head the letter B, and so forth. And for each letter, there is a particular pattern of activity, but this is very noisy. And you need, you need several examples, many examples, of thinking about letter A, thinking about letter B, thinking about letter C, each one has a little different structure of this activity of around the electrodes, but eventually the machine learning enables to learn your own letter A representation and your own letter B representation, if you have enough examples of that, and then eventually split it into clusters, so this cluster of activity will be understood by the machine as the letter A and B and C and so on. So forth. And then you can start to interact with this person who could not speak, but you can think about speaking, and that's what happens. So I'm showing you now a, a communication, brain-to-text communication by this fellow, this is a Brazilian guy, that can start to speak, so to speak, speak, directly from his brain into the machine. So he's starting to speak. So they ask him the question, where were you born? And he's answering, actually quite fast. So, you know, I type on the cell phone something, maybe you faster, the young kids, but I type about 90 letters a second, a minute in my cell phone, and he's doing it about something like 30 letters a second, a minute from his brain, so that's very fast communication. Well, I was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, 
you can start to interact, I want food, I'm hungry, I want my wife to come and so forth. So this is a brain machine interface around language. Language prosthesis, you can call it. So this is one direction and, and recently, and this is very recently, so this is really almost prepared for you because I, I was not aware of it before uh, learning for, for this talk about what's happening. So, so there are recent two technologies which are really even much more advanced and much more heavily using AI and language models, high mentioned large language models. So you know a lot about how the structure of language and they make use of it with AI to try to understand what the brain of this person is trying to say if you have this large language models in addition to all capabilities to record from the brain and to practice a little bit and so forth. So there are these new, two new technologies or two new successes I would say. These are two back-to-back -back nature papers that just came a month ago or so. So this is one technology where you put the electrodes on the surface. ECO it is called. You put the, the, the electrode on the surface, something on the order of 64 or so, uh, on, uh, and you have a database for vocabulary, so you teach the person to think about these different words, and you record, as I said before, for the word uh, father, mother, and so forth. And eventually, the machine, plus knowing about the structure of language, uh, are deciphering what this person is trying to do, to say. Okay, electrodes placed on the surface of a wide area of the brain cortex to record brain activity, which is translated into speech or text using recurrent neural networks. So this is machine learning. A language model is used to reduce error in the composed sentences. So this is one technology. The other technology is what Haggai is using, is really fine, fine scale electrodes many many electrodes and this has a much bigger vocabulary scale so these people can talk more broadly they have more vocabulary so in this case it's an array of micro electrodes these are not micro electrodes these are big electrodes on the surface and these are micro electrodes going into the brain so these are the two technologies that came back to back at the same time from two different groups so i want to show you the success of the two so this is the microelectrode. This person cannot articulate words. It can do that. That's it. But the machine can recognize what he wants to do to say. The machine can decipher from this activity what he wants to say. Okay. That's, that's amazing. It's not, it's not easy to hear how, how suffering this fellow is. The other technology from another group is doing the following. This is a woman. In this case, they are using avatar to interact with a person. Decoded from a neural implant, decoded into a text. So there is a text coming here, the target center that he should think about, or she should think about this. this. So, so the avatar, of course, doesn't see this. It's only you who see it. And you think I about this. I think you are wonderful. So he's thinking about the sentence, for example, this one. He's thinking about that. The machine is reading it out. Give me a few minutes. Okay. So this is a brain-machine interface, quite dramatic, I think, uh, a breakthrough. Okay, so <coughs> before ending, I, I want to show you uh, something about avatars. You already saw a, a use of an avatar in order for this an interaction with the person and the avatar, but there is much more advanced things that are being done today with avatars, and I want to show you just a few. That I'm very fascinated with this uh, uh, avatar. So I should tell you about uh, four years or five years ago, together with Aviv and Iran, we organized uh, at Eli and Adiz Elsex Center a meeting we called What Makes Us Human. And in this meeting, What Makes Us Human, we invited a particular fellow from Barcelona who has a big lab on, of avatars. He developed avatars for different uses. I will show you a little clip of his, of his lecture. He gave a, a, an amazing lecture, I must say, I was really 
very happy about this lecture and about this modern world of using digital copy of yourself and you will see in a second digital copy of Freud to treat you and this is very successful treatment because it's Freud who is treating you, it's not somebody else and so forth. So anyway, so these avatars are now being used for many, many purposes. I'll show you one example of using it for schizophrenic patients where they hear this, con this nagging sound of somebody else talking to myself and this somebody else apparently has a face, a, a, a sound and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a structure. They know this person, this other person is schizophrenic. You can use this as an avatar and deal with the avatar within your brain, but now you put the avatar outside. I'll show you this one. I'll show you another case. He showed in Israel a case where people, men, aggressive men, beating their wives that are being taken into prison, now in, in Spain are being used as an avatar in order to see what they do, how aggressive they are. It's like an extension of yourself outside. And so this is becoming more and more a, a successful treatment for certain diseases. So I want to show you this, this in this case from London. Using avatar to treat schizophrenia. You are rubbish. You are rubbish. This is the, this is the image inside her brain. Can you go with me? That's good, Lauren. That's good. But can you try and make it a bit stronger for me? S sit up. Look at him. Tell him to go away, okay? Avatar therapy is for people who hear distressing, voluntary hallucinations or voices. So these are mainly people who have diagnoses of schizophrenia and related conditions. A computer system is used to create a face representing the entity that the person usually believes is behind my voices. And the software is remarkable that it can produce a complete range of, of voices, voice transforms, so that you get a very high match of what the person experiences to what they see on the computer. When other his friends asked him if he would like to go out with them, the glowing answer, I don't know. He wouldn't say yes, and he wouldn't say no either. So the therapy is delivered over six sessions, each of about ten minutes long, where the person is having a dialogue with their avatar. And gradually the avatar changes in response to the person standing up to it. So as the person says, I'm tired of hearing this movie alone, the avatar gradually concedes. The whole experience changes from something as so the point is to stand in front of your avatar, but now it's the avatar outside of you, and you rebel against this avatar. You, you say, go away. I don't want you inside me. Go away. In the beginning it's very hard for the patients to deal with their own person inside, but now it's outside, and they can talk to them or to her. And it's changing due to this interaction. And eventually they go away. This avatar, so to speak, go away because you succeed to rebel, apparently. And the claim is, the statistics is an extremely good success of treating schizophrenic patients with these avatar interactions rather than with drugs and so forth that most of the time do not really do the job. Yes? But the text that the avatar says is the text that he thinks about? No, it's not brain-machine interface in a direct sense. But it's the avatar that, you know, she reported a lot before to the, to the psycho psychoanalysis about what is this avatar is telling her and so forth. There are several people, not sometimes not only one. But this is a new treatment and apparently it's working extremely well. The fact that you can externalize your inside nagging uh, figure and you deal, deal with her with the help of somebody who sees this, uh, apparently, uh, statistically, this fellow who is a well-known psychiatrist from London is doing very well. Is, is, is as this, the appearance of the av avatar is the first described by this person, so the avatar looks like that, and they build an avatar that is similar to what she or he described as the person inside. They build an avatar, which is becoming more and more close to, to the reality, so to speak, as you will see in a second, and then, and then you deal with the avatar, which is your, ava your person inside becomes an avatar outside, similar to what you feel inside, also with the voice and all that. Well, that answers the question. Okay, so that's... Yeah, it's individual. So let me give you a little piece. Well, you have a couple of questions. Oh, sorry. Yes, please. Uh, what happens uh, if during your talking, like while you're talking to the avatar... So I can't hear you very well. Uh, what happens if while you're talking to the avatar, uh, the schizophrenic person that's 
inside your head actually starts to talk to you. Like the actual person, not the avatar. Okay, so you say, you say, let's say there is this avatar that is inside you, but now it's in the <laughs> avatar, and you tell him, go away. I don't want to see you anymore. You, 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 I don't want, I hate you. Go away. In the beginning, it's very hard for them to really reject somebody that is inside them, apparently. So if you look at these movies, and, and I can give you the movies. And, and so the avatar slowly, slowly reacts to you. It becomes more shy, it becomes more closed, and eventually disappears. So the disappearance of the avatar is a signature that you succeeded to confront the avatar, mm. which is your own person, and, 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 and they reported that the sounds disappear, and the person disappears, and they are less schizophrenic than they used to be before. No, it's just less. Less. Yes. Yes, there so must be some changes inside the brain due to this interaction. That's the beauty of the brain, that you make some new interaction with some a new figure, and uh, it behaviorally, they, they seem to be in a much better shape. So that's a report from... Again, it's not my profession, I'm just reporting what these people are reporting. And I, so there was another question? Okay, so I want, to, I want just to show you a little piece of what they do in... in a, 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 is, it, is it working? Yes. yes. Of, of what they do in, uh, in in Barcelona because I have a connection with them that I will tell you about in a second. And it's actually this one, the one I like best. Oh, really? that. So how does this work? It's, um, we can embody people as anybody, first person perspective, real time motion capture, and in particular we can embody people as Sigma and Freud. Why Freud I'll say later. So the way this works is first of all we scan the person to get a good representation of them and then they talk, they're embodied as themselves, they see themselves in the mirror and then they, they explain a problem to Sigmund Freud and then they are in Sigmund Freud's body and they see and hear themselves explain the problem and then it just keeps swapping backwards and forwards between, I know it sounds crazy, but they keep swapping backwards and forwards between the two conditions. So we did a first study, we found body ownership in the Freud body was high and that's very interesting because remember the other body would I just want to mention this body, body ownership. It's very interesting that, you know, we spoke a little bit about that, you know, when you use a tool, when a painter uses a brush, we spoke with Ellie, when you use a brush for many, many years, the brush is internalized, so to speak, into your brain, it becomes part of your extension. And when you ask painters, where do you feel that you touch the paint, they say, I feel it in the tip of the brush. They don't say that I feel it in the tip of my head, but in the feel of the brush. Of course, in the brush there are no sensors, but they feel it in the end of the brush. So they extended the brush, there is a representation of the brush in their brain. And when they do this so many long time, and the brush becomes part of their body, like a car becomes part of your body. So this internalization, what we call embodiment of somebody from the outside inside, is working very well with avatar. Apparently very far, fast you can internalize an avatar and feel that you and the avatar are somewhat similar. And that's a, that's a very interesting capability of the brain to extend, to, to, to internalize things in the world and make them part of you. For example, a, a, a third hand or a tool that you may be using or a robot and so forth. So that's what he's speaking about, how fast Freud becomes you in some sense. Yes. In Gestalt therapy, you are, uh, for instance, uh, you have a uh, uh, conflict with your father, you sit on one cushion and you speak to your father, then you sit on the other cushion and you are your father. Exactly. So this is very similar. Abs absolutely similar. But in this case, the father is an avatar. It's you don't need to imitate your father. No, the new thing, the new thing is that there is, there is a father, avatar. There is a physical, physical, digital, there is something clear and this something is changing due to your interaction with it. So it's not only within you, so to speak, it's also external to you. And that's much, much faster, that, that all, much faster mm -hmm. than all type of, uh, of, of because, because, it, because it's outside, because it's yeah. externalized. But you're right, the principle is absolutely the same. You imitate yourself, so to speak, then you imitate your father, you play the role of both, and then you can see much more balanced view of both. But in this case, the both becomes a digital figure, a real figure, a father. We'll talk about digital immortality in a second because then you can...
can take your own digital avatar and make it alive forever. Or you okay. become forever. In this cult, you can change your father's opinion about you, for instance. Of course. So, but because your father is within you, so if, yeah. if you change something in you, your father changes. But then it just becomes more real. That's, that's the main thing here. But the, the principle is absolutely the same, as you mentioned. It's the same idea, that you internalize, externalize something that you want to deal with. But in this case, Avatar has... The force was really themselves. And this illustrates that body ownership is highly dependent on the multisensory stimulation, not on appearance. So whether they were embodied in Freud body or there were some other conditions I don't have time to describe, they all improved their mood and happiness simply because they talked about their problem. But those with body ownership in the Freud body had the better improvement. Why did we choose Freud? Because beforehand we'd asked, we wanted to have someone everyone would recognize. Beforehand we'd asked for some of the people, who would you like to explain a personal problem to? And to our surprise, number two came Angelina Jolie. <laughs> and number one was Freud, so we had to go with Freud. We had a second study where you could be... In I can understand people who want Angelina Jolie to be their psychologist. Maybe I would choose her rather than Freud. I don't know. I, I should discuss it in, in Barcelona. Who knows? You do the body swapping with Freud or just speak to a simulated Freud who would ask you various pre-programmed questions. And the, the results of this were very good. The, uh, compared with a simulated Freud, um, they got better knowledge of their problem, better understanding, new ideas, better control, and it helped. And it's actually this is an interesting use of your avatar. So I want to end uh, by something that is happening these days. So, so recently I flew to Bhutan with Yuval Noah Harari to meet the king there, and so the queen, the king, and I flew with a person very well known in Israel. His name is Sir Ronald Cohen. Some of you may know him from London. And Sir Ronald Cohen is one of the guru, the big, the big inventor of what is called impact economy. He's a very interesting fellow and, and we had a go very good discussion in this private plane to Bhutan. Mm -hmm. And then he told me about a meeting that he's doing every year with about thousand participants, this impact economy meeting, which is going to be in October, so within a month, 2nd of October, in Malaga. Why Malaga? Because Picasso was born in Malaga and died exactly 15, 50 years ago, so 73, and he wanted to have a meeting around creativity in economy, in brain sciences, in arts, and so forth, and so we discussed it, and so I had this idea. Why won't you invite to your meeting the most creative people in the world, and in Spain in particular, <coughs> Ramon Cajal. Ramon Cajal was an, a, 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 an amazing anatomist, biggest anatomist probably ever, uh, that won Nobel Prize in 1906 for his discovery of the neuron, of the nerve cell. And I don't know if you know, but people did not realize that the brain is, is built from nerve cells. And actually, yes, now I'm reminded that Ramon Cajal appears on your bags, on the white bags at your hotel, a drawing by Ramon Cajal. He was a wonderful painter, he was an artist and so forth. So this is a very, very ingenious, very, very creative person, very unusual personality. We don't need to speak about Picasso, he's an absolute genius, impossible genius, but a genius. So I told him, let's develop avatars of both in your meeting with this group in Barcelona, and they will discuss what they feel about art and brain, the mm -hmm. avatars. So Ronald Cohen thought that in the beginning of the time a little crazy that <laughs> Avatar will talk in his meetings for the first time ever, real-time Avatar interactions with chat GTP on the background. <laughs> so I made a, a Zoom convention with these people from Barcelona, Mel Slater, myself, and Ronald <coughs> Cohen, and we asked us to start with, and it's now being developed, the Avatars, what would, for example, Ramon Cajal, or what would Picasso would say if we we'll ask him the following question. Chat GDP. This is online, real time, when we spoke in front of these people in, in, in Barcelona from Tel Aviv with Ronald Cohen. A question to Picasso. Do you believe that art could change the world? There are some people here that believe it. Me too. So here is the, quest, the answer. Of course, I cannot speak directly for Pablo Picasso, but based on his life, work, and document opinions, 
here is an hypothetical, hypothetical response he might give. I just want to, to, to again emphasize what Chaim told. I, I'm, I'm done. I'm at the end. What Chaim told you. In order to generate such an, an answer, real time online, this machine should go to all the Spanish writing of Picasso. Everything was translated by Picasso. These are billions of letters and words, real time online. And then design from these large language models that Heim spoke about them, an answer. So behind this fast answer, which is online real time, that's how they can avatar talk to each other real time, there is a huge background computation to deal with all that Picasso said. So here is what Picasso said, so to speak. Art is not just a mirror to society. It's a hammer within which to shape it. Throughout history, art has always played a crucial role in challenging conventions, questioning authority, and deciphering the triumph and strategies of humanity. Even brushstroke, every brushstroke, every color, every form I choose is a reflection of my experiences, emotions, and perspective. Consider my painting Guernica so he's speaking a little bit about why he painted Guernica, which is the most well-known painting of Picasso in Madrid. I was not just, it was not just an artistic endeavor, Guernica, after the war, after the civil war. I, it was a political statement, a cry for peace, a documentation of brutality. Art has the power to evoke emotions, provide thoughts, and inspire action. Whether it's a champion the cause provides solace uh, uh, or represents the violence, art has always been a potent tool for change. In this way, yes, I genuinely believe art can change the world one viewer at a time. That's Avatar Picasso. And then we ask what does Ramonica Hall say about the question, do you believe that science will change the world for the better? So again, the machine said, I cannot speak in the name of it, of, but taking all this information. Science is a torch that illuminates the darkest corners of the universe, unveiling the intricate tapestry of nature. Through my studies of the nervous system, I've come to appreciate the complexity, beauty, and the elegance of life's design. The human brain itself is a torn testament to nature genius, with its myriad of neurons and intricate connections. You see, so already he started the self-census program that I'm part of. Throughout history, scientists transformed our understanding of the world, paving the way for advancement that have, achieved, that have elevated suffering, extended life spent, and improved our quality of life. The same microscope that has allowed me to glimpse the window of architecture of the brain has also enabled others to discover the cause of diseases and to develop treatments. In essence, I do believe that science has the potential to change the world for the better, but it's up to us, the stewards of this knowledge, to ensure that, it is, that its fruits are used to nourish humanity rather than to harm. <laughs> this is online discussion between two avatars, yes? Okay, so you are of course invited, and I want to say thank you for all of you for coming to the Brain Circuit, and I want to cite what uh, uh, Anschnitt said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious, it is the source of all true art and science, this is why I, <laughs> Einstein, <laughs> wants to join the <laughs> Thank you very much.